in progress. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today. It looks like we're ready to start. Sorry for the slow delay. Um, so good morning. Uh, welcome to the California Building Standards Commission rulemaking training. Uh, thanks for all signing up and attending this training today. We know some of you are experienced in the rulemaking process. Uh, some of you may not be. Uh, so we encourage you to ask questions and um, call us if you have any uh, questions during uh, during the rulemaking cycles. And if you have questions during this um, training, do they just raise their raise your hands and then uh, Laura will help me out with that. So go on to the next slide. So today the presenters are myself. My name is Brandon Estes. I'm an associate construction analyst with the California Buildings Standards Commission. I'll be going over the intro. Uh, after me will be Irina Brosman, Associate Architect. She'll cover step one, the cycle prep and uh, BSC's new templates. Let me minimize this little window here. Uh, following Irina will be Kevin Day, Staff, Staff Services Manager. He'll cover the uh, connection between the uh, Department of Finance 399 form and the NOPA, and that's the Notice of Proposed Action. Uh, and last but not least is Beth Maynard, Associate Construction Analyst. She'll be covering uh, the document accessibility. Uh, next slide. A couple housekeeping items. Um, be sure to keep your mic or your phone on mute if you are not speaking. Um, raise your hand, use the chat to indicate that you not. Yeah, there's no chat. Okay, excuse me, no chat today. Um, just raise your hand if you have a question uh, and you know, feel free to interrupt. Um, uh, please, however, do not mute, uh, unmute or speak until you are recognized. Um, we'll check in with everybody at the end of the session to make sure you're ready to move on. Um, and thank you for participating. So next slide, please. Um, acknowledgements. So we would like to make a few acknowledgements. Thanks goes uh, to our administrative staff for coordinating this event and all the training materials. Also, thanks to everybody for attending this training. We do have a lot to cover and we really appreciate your time and participation today. Uh, next, Laura Mills will take care of roll call. So please state your name, agency you are with, and how many years of rulemaking experience you have, or if you are new to the process. So Laura. All right, I'm gonna do a roll call of um, the list that I have of people who received the invitation. Um, Starting with Amanda Ferreria. Good morning. My name is Amanda Ferreria. I'm with the Board of State and Community Corrections, and I have about four years of rulemaking experience. Excellent. Thank you. Ginger Wolf. Good morning. This is Ginger Wolf. I am also with the Board of State and Community Corrections. And I have uh, almost 10 years of experience with rulemaking. Thank you. Lindsay Tu. Good morning. My name is Lindsay Tu. Uh, I'm also to, with the Board of State and Community Correction. Um, I have about, I want to say, four or five uh, of experience in rulemaking, but it's not continuous. Thank you. Thank you. Kareen Fishman. Hi, good morning. This is Corrine Fishman. Um, I'm with the California Energy Commission and I have a little over nine years of experience doing rulemakings. Thank you. Haley Bacanig. Hopefully I didn't butcher your name too <laughs> No, that wasn't too bad. This is Haley Bruckenegg. I'm also with the California Energy Commission. Um, about five or six years of um, rulemaking experience. Thank you. Uh, is Peter Strait on the line? He was tentative. Allison Lee. Good morning. My name is Allison. I'm with the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology, and I have about two and a half to three years of experience with regulations. Thank you. Christy Underwood. All right. 
right. Maybe she'll join us later. Lori Martinez. Usha Mutschler. Good morning. Yeah, Usha Mutschler with Board of Pharmacy. Um, I have no experience. Fran, thanking you. Thank you. All right, nice to have you with us, Usha. Hopefully you'll gain a lot from today's presentation. Thank you, I'm sure I will. Looking forward to it. Bob Glasgow. Yeah, this is Bob. Uh, this is my first time attending one of these meetings, actually. All right, welcome. Thank you. Brian Frank. Derek Shaw. Hi, this is Derek Shaw, Sorry, the Division of the Brian. State Architect. Um, I have uh, 19 or 20 years of um, rulemaking background. Excellent. Nice to hear from you today, Derek. Was, was Brian there? I, I see you on our list here and you're unmuted. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Brian, I have one year of experience. All right. Diane Gould. Eric Drever. Hi, this is Eric Drever with uh, Division of the State Architect. And I have, um, let's see, it's August. I have 10 months of rulemaking experience. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Karen Roberts. Michelle Davis. Good morning, Michelle Davis with Division of the State Architect. I am new to the rulemaking process. All right, welcome. And Michelle Golden. Hi, I'm Michelle Golden, um, Senior Architect at DSA under um, Headquarters Codes and Policies. I have one cycle under Derek Shaw's expert tutelage of rulemaking. Excellent. And Paul Johnson. This is Paul. Sorry, Paul, I muted you. Can you unmute again? I was trying to mute somebody else. <laughs> oh, sorry. So um, this is Paul Johnson with the Division of State Architect. I have two years of experience. Thank you. Randy Thomas. Good morning, Randy Thomas with the Division of the State Architect. I have about four years of experience with the rulemaking. Thank you. Ryan Huxley. Hi, this is Ryan Huxley with the California Division of the State Architect, and I have about seven years of experience in rulemaking. Fabulous. Ryan Turner. Uh, Ryan Turner, also with Division of the State Architect, and I have about four years of experience with rulemaking. Thank you. Tav Commons. Okay, uh, Daniel Deloach. Not yet. David Brown. George Barnes. Susan Pei. Susan Pei, Division of the State Architect, zero rulemaking experience. All right, welcome. Make sure you raise your hand if you have questions during the presentation. We'll be happy to help you out. Gwen Huff. Jody Evans. Hi, I'm Jody, and um, I'm from the Department of Water Resources, and 
I am also brand new to rule making. Uh, thank you, Jody. Julia Ekstrom. Julie Sar Edmonds. Nancy King. Hello, this is Nancy King. I also work for the Department of Water Resources and I have six years of rulemaking experience. Thank you, Nancy. And Richard Mills. Hi, this is the Rich Mills with the Department of Water Resources, probably about 10 years or so of rulemaking experience. Thank you. Um, now moving on to Department of Healthcare Access and Information, Jamie Schnick. Yes, this is Jamie Schnick, a senior electrical engineer. This is my, I'm just getting started in the process. All right, welcome. Thank you. Larry Enright. Hi, I'm Larry Enright, senior mechanical engineer with HKI. I'm about a year of experience. Thank you. Lori Campbell. Good morning. This is Lori Campbell with Oshpod HKI, and I have about three years of experience. Thank you, Lori. Nancy Matsura. Oh, she declined. Never mind. Oops. Richard Tannenhill. Roy Lobo. Okay, moving on to HCD. Damien Fan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Damien. I'm with the uh, HCD's Codes and Standards Division. I uh, have about eight months of experience in rulemaking. Welcome, Damien. Emily Hill. Hi, good morning. Emily Hill from HCD Codes and Standards. I have about six months of rulemaking experience. This is my first rulemaking cycle. Thanks so much for the, the training. Looking forward to learning more about it. Thank you, Emily. And Emily Withers. Hi, this is Emily Withers from HCD. I have about 13 years of rulemaking experience with the state housing law program, but there's always something new in either the APA or building standards uh, process to learn. So anyways, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. It, today we'll also um, share um, lessons learned from the last cycle. So. Uh, as you said, always something new to learn. Uh, next is Jeffrey Cooney. Hi, I'm Jeff Cooney, HCD Codes and Standards, and I'm new to rulemaking. Thank you. Jenna Klein. Unfortunately, she's out today. Okay. Or the rest of the week, yeah. Thank you. Laura Turner. Hi, um, I'm Laura Turner. I'm HCD Codes and Standards Regulations Unit Manager, and I have about five years of rulemaking experience. Thank you. Randy and Rico. Tom Martin. Good morning. This is Tom Martin. I'm with HCD. I'm kind of new to this, only 10 years doing it. <laughs> Oh, welcome, Tom. Tyler Mayo. Good morning. This is Tyler Mayo. I'm with HCD's Division of Codes and Standards. I have about eight months of rulemaking experience. Veronica Turdine. Good morning. My name is Veronica Turdine, Associate Construction Analyst with Housing and Community Development. I have about almost two and a half to three years experience in rulemaking. Right. Thanks, Veronica. And Thank S SFM, Crystal Sujeski. Good morning, Crystal Sujeski. I've got over eight years experience. Thank you. Thank you. Irene Flannery. 
Hi, this is Erin Flannery. I've got about six months of experience. Thank you. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. No, no problem. Greg Anderson. No Greg yet. He'll probably join us later. And Jose Sanabria. He's he's out on vacation. He's out. So. Okay. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is there anybody on the call who I did not call who wants to introduce yourselves? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you in the order of hands raised. Oh, there's Richard. Richard's here. Go ahead, Richard. Hi, sorry for being late. It's Richard Tannehill with HK. I've had about uh, two to three years experience. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Eric, go ahead. Uh, I've been chatting with a couple of my staff who you called, but they're having some audio issues. George Barnes and Tap Cummins are both in, uh, in the meeting. Oh, no. All right. They can hear us okay? Yes. Okay, super. Thank yes, you. Yes, I can hear. Oh, there's George. thanks, George. There's hey, George. the microphone works. Hey, this is George, DSA. Thank you very much. I'm having a little microphone issue. Uh, good morning to all. I've been with DSA since 2009, and my uh, facet into rulemaking really is I, I function with the State Fire Marshal's office and with our own internal staff, but personally have not been directly involved. Thank you. All right. Welcome, George. I'm, I'm glad the rest of your staff was able to make it uh, and join us for this training. Yep. All right. And then go ahead. Yeah. Mute yourself. Perfect. Okay, I think that's it. I see no other hands raised, so I'm going to pass this back to Brandon. All right. Thank you, Laura. I suppose thanks, everybody, for your introductions. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, from a script mostly, and sometimes I tend to read a little fast. So if you need me to slow down, just raise your hand. Um, so why are we here today? Uh, first is to provide an overview of the code adoption process or rulemaking cycle. Uh, the purpose of CBSC's rulemaking cycle is to adopt regulations or to amend existing regulations in Title 24, also known as the California Building Standards Code. There are numerous reasons for amending Title 24, examples of which are legislative mandates, complying with existing law, and keeping pace with industry and technology. Uh, our code adoption cycles require 18 months to complete. During the triennial cycle, new model codes are adopted by the commission as required by state law and agencies propose amendments to these model codes. During the intervening cycle, which is the 18 month cycle between each triennial, further amendments are made to the code, which result in supplements to the current edition of Title 24. At the current time, we are administering the intervening cycle for the 2022 edition of Title 24. Hey, did we mention anything about the captioning? There it's on. Okay, it's working. Okay. Uh, so the supplements will be published January 1 of 2024 and effective July 1 of 2024. Uh, we will also go over some of the resources provided by CBSC, which will assist in your rulemaking document development and maintenance. So the second reason why we are here is to provide an overview of the cycle prep and templates. CBSC follows the intent of the APA or Administrative Procedure Act when administering the rulemaking cycle. The APA sets forth the procedures by which state agencies must follow when proposing and adopting regulations. These procedures ensure transparency and public participation. Building standards law authorizes CBSC to administer the rulemaking process for Title 24, which is specific to building standards. All proposed and adopted building standards must be either adopted by the commission or approved by the commission. Regulations that are not building standards are administered by the Office of Administrative Law. Irina Brosman will be going over the cycle prep and the document templates in more detail soon. For the connection between the Department of Finance 399 and the NOPA, Kevin Day will address these documents and explain how these two documents are uh, quite connected. Uh, and regarding accessibility requirements, as many of you may be aware, 
pursuant to AB 434, documents posted to state websites must be accessible to persons with disabilities. This includes rulemaking documents pertaining to building standards. Beth Maynard will be going into more detail on this topic in step three. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so rulemaking fundamentals. Um, in order to prep for the cycle process, we will cover the fundamental elements of the cycle process and direct you to resources that will help you in planning for the cycle. So next slide. Uh, so resources. The training reference materials have been shared with you using a SharePoint external link. They were not shared in the meeting invite. Uh, SharePoint external is like box.com. It's a repository for files of all types. This will allow you to download and save relevant, relevant documents to your own computer for printing or as a reference. Uh, the documents we have shared with you include this presentation, the guide for creating proposed building standards, rulemaking templates, some of which were provided to agencies after the coordinating council meeting, and CBSC's accessibility checklist with instructions and more. Within Appendix E of the Guide for Creating Proposed Building Standards is a list of do's and don'ts for successful rulemaking. This was developed from lessons learned during last cycle. I highly recommend keeping this nearby as you're preparing your rulemaking documents. If you have any questions about SharePoint External, please contact Laura Mills. Uh, so the Guide to Creating Proposed Building Standards is included in your training materials and also available from our website. Please use it to assist you in your document preparation. CDSC has developed this guide to assist state agencies that are responsible for preparing the rulemaking documents. Adherence to these guidelines will prevent hiccups in the rulemaking process. These guidelines serve to streamline the work that CBSC staff must perform to prepare the documents for the various code advisory meetings, CBSC public meetings, and web postings. Additionally, Consistency among rulemaking documents created by various agencies uh, assists CBSC in codification and coordination with the publishers. Again, to this point, refer to the do's and don'ts document in your binder. The steps we are covering today are also outlined in this guide, so please bookmark this guide on your browser for easy reference. CBSC's webpage also offers other guidebooks with additional information uh, which you will find helpful to develop effective rulemaking documents. And of course, uh, CBSC staff will be available to assist you throughout the uh, cycle timelines with your document prep. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the rulemaking process flowchart. Uh, this chart represents the uh, general rulemaking process with no specific timeframes given. Uh, a timeline, we'll provide a timeline later on that is more specific to the building standards uh, cycle. Um, so this particular flow chart is used to get an idea of what can be expected at each phase of the rulemaking process. Uh, it also incorporates requirements of building standards law as well as the Administrative Procedure Act. So the top of the flow chart represents the beginning of the rulemaking process, starting with pre-cycle activities. Uh, Pre-cycle activities are administered by the agency which is proposing the building standards and can occur at any time. Uh, some proposed regulations require substantial pre-cycle activities that can span rule multiple rulemaking cycles, while other proposed regulations that need only one workshop to develop regulations. Some regulations don't require any pre-cycle activities. Uh, depending on the nature of the proposed regulations, sometimes multiple state agencies host joint rulemaking uh, pre-cycle workshops. So the purpose of pre-cycle activities is to solicit input from the public and other stakeholders. These activities may include model code research, legislative analysis, legal scrutiny, code language development, workshops, focus groups, and document preparation. Uh, incorporating Public participation is required by the Administrative Procedure Act, or the APA, to provide transparency when developing regulations. By providing this transparency, the state, agents, the state agencies receive important stakeholder feedback to further develop the proposed code language and resolve potential conflicts and discrepancies. At various phases of the rulemaking process, 
The public is provided the opportunity to attend workshops, code advisory committee meetings, as well as commission meetings. The public may also provide written comment regarding proposed regulations during the public comment periods. So on this flowchart, the green ovals represent the various public participation opportunities. Uh, during pre-cycle activities, the proposing agencies prepare the CBSC rulemaking documents in prep for the CBSC rulemaking cycle. If the agency wants to move forward in the current cycle, the agency will submit the required rulemaking documents to CBSC by the due date. This due date marks the beginning of the CBSC rulemaking cycle, which you will see is the second blue bar on the flowchart and provide CBSC staff the time to prep the rulemaking documents for the code advisory committees. The code advisory committees or CACs are a panel of representatives with backgrounds in fire and life safety, local government and engineering to name a few. The agency presents their proposed regulations to the appropriate CAC and the CAC members and the public may make comments and recommendations about the code change proposals. The agency will consider the comments and recommendations then apply appropriately. Uh, so the third blue bar, we arrive, um, this marks the beginning of the APA portion of the rulemaking cycle. This portion of the cycle officially begin when the agency's notice of proposed action or NOPA is issued and the 45 day public comment period begins. Along with the NOPA, the agency resubmits all the required rulemaking documents to CBSC, which will include any updates to the proposed regulations pursuant to comments received by the CACs and the public. And again, the CAC, uh, those are the code advisory committees. So note that the flowchart identifies the APA portion of the rulemaking cycle as having one year maximum to complete, to complete the rulemaking and formally adopt the newly developed codes and amendments. Please bear in mind that uh, for building standards, this does not mean that agencies have one year to develop regulations. Because of the statutory requirements to provide 180 days between the publication of the codes and the effective date of the codes, as well as the work involved in publishing the codes, there is much less than one year to actually develop building standards. While many other state agencies that develop regulations have the luxury of a full year, uh, these agencies typically go through the Office of Administrative Law. Um, agencies that develop building standards do not have the full year and thus we have very tight deadlines that must be adhered to. So a potential consequence of not meeting the, dead, the tight deadlines may be that an agency's proposed regulations do not get adopted by the commission. Uh, it's also important to note that once the cycle clock starts, no, additioner, no additional major rulemaking items are considered for the remainder of the cycle. So in general, the triennial cycle, it's somewhat fluid. Uh, we must all work together to achieve each milestone all the way through to the close of the rulemaking record, at which point we get to take a deep sigh of relief. So a full version of this flowchart is available in the, uh, in the material that we've provided. Is the speed okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, the diagram in this slide represents the fundamental steps that rulemaking documents go through during a typical rulemaking cycle. Uh, so first we have intention and an agency can show intention by a few means. The first being the coordinating council. Uh, the coordinating council is comprised of representatives of the what of the proposing agencies the coordinating council is an essential part of the pre-cycle activities that is very productive in the rulemaking process proposing agencies meet with cbsc staff and share their propo proposals and concerns that may result in proposed code changes agencies work together to identify and coordinate co-adopted amendments and code sections. So this is not a formal venue. Basically, the coordinating council is a roundtable discussion with proposing agencies focused on the upcoming cycle. So the recent coordinating council for this cycle uh, met on May 3rd of this year. So the, excuse me, the second means is a letter of intent. 
which is a broad outline in writing presented to CBSC of what an agency generally intends to propose during the pre, uh, during the to propose during the cycle. Excuse me. Uh, so lastly, we have industry and agency workshops. Uh, workshops involve industry experts, stakeholders, co-adopting agencies, and interested public organizations. These are open to the public. Uh, section 1-403 of the California Administrative Code addresses the preparation of regulations through the pre-cycle public, pre public participation and workshops. That's a mouthful. Um, so this is a valuable part of the rulemaking process and that most of the language in the express terms is developed and critically reviewed using these workshop venues. So uh, the next bubble, we have the initial submittals. Uh, during this phase, CBSC accepts and reviews the agency rulemaking packages. We review document packages for completeness and accuracy review for compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act or the APA and check for content accuracy. CBSE will return non-accessible files to the agency and work with the agency to ensure compliance for web posting. Also during this phase, we have the Code Advisory Committees or CACs. This is, uh, this is again different from the, um, uh, what was I just talking about, Laura? The, the, co the Coordinating Council. Um, I got tripped up all earlier. So uh, the CACs, uh, do you hear that feedback? Okay. CACs are similar to commission meetings, but differ in that all sections, all actions recommended by the CAC members are intended to improve the initial rulemaking files and in particular the express terms. Uh, CACs are made up of industry professionals, agency representatives, and a representative of the general public. Various CACs focus on specific parts of Title 24 and on one or more discipline and agencies. For example, the health facilities CAC meeting primarily involves one agency, uh, Healthcare Access and Administration, or uh, also known as OSHPON. Uh, the Green or PME CAC involves all agencies with authority to amend Calgary, uh, the plumbing, mechanical, electrical, and energy codes. Uh, CBSC will schedule these events early in the cycle to allow as much time as possible for proposing agencies and stakeholders to prepare and develop the rulemaking packages. The agencies are given great weight with respect to their decision to follow CAC recommendations. However, all agencies must respond to each CAC recommendation in the revised initial statement of reasons for the ISOR by explaining what, if any, action was taken or not taken to address the recommendation. The general public can attend and participate, listen in, submit comments, and address the committee members at this time. Much of the development of amended code language occurs up to this point. So next bubble is the uh, comment period. So upon completion of the CAC meetings, the agencies then resubmit the initial rulemaking files for the public comment period. This, these files include the NOPA, uh, which is also known as the Notice of Proposed Action, the 45-day express terms, the revised initial statement of reasons or the ISOR, and any other rulemaking documents that have been updated since the initial rulemaking file was submitted for code advisory committee review. CBSC and the agencies then prepare for the public comment periods, the first being 45 days. On behalf of the proposing agencies, CBSC issues a formal notice th through the Office of Administrative Law or OAL using their California Regulatory Notice Register. The issuance of the NOPA is a significant and formal step in the process. This is the official notice to the general public regarding the opportunity to participate in the rulemaking process. At this point, all relevant rulemaking documents are posted to the web. The public is encouraged to submit written comments related to the rulemaking items. Additional comment periods of 45 or 15 days may be needed to further analyze individual items and to solicit additional public input. Comments are mailed or emailed to CBSC or to the individual proposing agencies within the allotted 45 or 15 day public comment periods. So now we move on to hearings. 
When no public hearing is scheduled as part of a public comment period, California Administrative Code Section 1-413 outlines the requirements to request a public hearing. A public hearing allowing oral or written comments must be requested a minimum of 15 days prior to the end of the 45-day public comment period. Uh, and to note, the public hearing is really used. Um, so the last bubble is the final submittal. Uh, at the conclusion of the public comment periods, agencies have just a few weeks to wrap up their responses and prepare the final submittal documents. The final submittal documents are essentially the same as the initial submittal documents, but the final documents represent the last stage of the process before the agencies formally present their proposals to the to the BSC commissioners. CBSC will ascertain whether the record of CAC recommendations as well as agency responses to the recommendations align with the agency proposals and vice versa. CBSC will also check for compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act. One example of something we check for is whether the final agency documents have properly addressed and documented the public com comments and corresponding agency responses. Uh, so finally, we arrive at the uh, commission action. The commission meetings are where the agencies formally present their proposals for approval and adoption. The commission takes action to approve, approve as amend, disapprove, or further study. Upon approval at the commission meeting, CBSC records all commission actions and then files the final express terms and the rulemaking face sheet with the Secretary of State. After documents are filed with the Secretary of State, which is the final phase of the code cycle, then comes the codification and publication. Uh, during codification and publication, the CBSC works with the various publishers to review drafts and codify the language with agency participation, and then finally to publish the text in the latest edition of Title 24. Currently, we are working on the supplement to the 2022 edition of Title 24. Uh, slide next slide. This is the last one, right? This, I think. Okay, so this is the uh, what we call the cigar timeline. This is specific to building standards rulemaking timeline. Um, so, and what you see here, this is the 2022 intervening cycle timeline. Uh, this dem this diagram demonstrates what phase of the process is occurring at any given point in the rulemaking process. Uh, so right now we are at the very beginning, wait, yeah, we're at the very beginning, um, that little gray area. Uh, so for now, you can see that the current dates align with the far left segment on the timeline. A crucial milestone date for many rulemaking documents is December 1st, 2022, which is just around the corner. Again, the rulemaking process is driven by law and specific dates are set according to how much time can be allotted for certain activities during the cycle. This diagram is useful to pin up in your office so you can stay oriented along the way. So I'm gonna use the next slide questions because that's all I got here. Q and A. So granted, this was an introduction. Um, other CBSC staff are going to go into more detail, but if you have questions, feel free to raise your hands and um, we can cover some of those. And we also have a poll. So I'm gonna launch a poll for you. And you could just answer your the poll that you see. Hopefully you see. I'm on the phone. I have a comment. Okay, go ahead. Hi, this is Nancy King. Um, I know that was a real long and detailed presentation. But I just wanted to make a comment on a couple of things that were kind of glossed over. And that is the initial submittal that an agency presents can only reduce in scope. It can't increase in scope. In other words, if you didn't propose it at the beginning of the 45 day cycle, you cannot do it throughout the rest of the cycle. And yes. it was mentioned there. Um, and I have an example with DWR, we had the 
our authority, which is in chapter one, it was not adequate. And we were challenged on it. And by the time we realized why we were being challenged, uh, it was too late to increase or correct the scope. We had to wait to the next cycle to do so, which is another comment about the further study and what that means is that it isn't an outright decline, but that there needs more work to be done. And so that more work will not be incorporated in the current cycle, unless there's some sort of emergency provisions or whatever, but that it would have to go to the next cycle. Well, if I think it would depend on the amount of work that would be required, the, the, the amount of further studying that would be required. But yeah, I, 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 I see your point. Um, other staff might be able to go into this on further detail. Are you saying then when the commission says further study at the commission meeting, the final meeting, that further study could mean that it would go back to the commission after further study immediately? No, I, suppose, I suppose if it was at the commission meeting, if they recommended further study, excuse me, maybe I was thinking the code advisory committee. So yeah, if the, if the commission did that, I think that's kind of the end. And one last thing was as far as the code advisory committee, the word advisory is clear that it's advice and not, it isn't mandated by them. However, what she did say, and I just wanted to clarify for everybody, is to be transparent and also to have a historical record that it's important to address those comments. And obviously it's required as well as, as from your presentation, but that it's to create transparency to any public that are there and may have heard the comment, but also in the future, if you're looking back and saying, why wasn't this addressed? What happened here? You can look at that record and you can see in your uh, statement of reasons what happened. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Nancy. And just to uh, add on to that, um, you know, great weight is given to the subject matter experts um, working for the state agency. All right, thank you, Nancy. Is that all? Yeah, that's it. I just wanted okay. to comment on those things because it was a long discussion there and there's a lot of detail. And those are some things that I learned. I'm sure other people heard other things but I just wanted to emphasize that for the new people. Thank you very much. Uh, Derek, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, Brandon, uh, I have two questions here. Um, the first one is regarding the document templates that um, were provided uh, as, as part of the training materials for today's session. Uh, are these document templates um, identical to those that were um, distributed on May 5th of this year? Yes. Or do these take the place of those documents? Oh, no, these are the same, same templates. OK, um, with additional document templates in, in the current um, group of, of attachments to this training. Was that? I'm sorry, I don't understand there, the second part of your question. There, there appear to be a, a great number of additional documents um, in, in the um, training materials, uh, well in excess of the number that were provided May 5th. Are they rulemaking templates? Yes. Okay, you know, Laura's gonna take this one. Thank you. Hey, Derek. So um, in the shared folder are not only the templates that you should use to submit your rulemaking folder or files to us, but there are also three sample documents. Mm -hmm. So there's a sample ET and a sample ISOR, and then a sample uh, grouping document, which is something that State Fire Marshal has been doing that the commissioners found helpful. Um, so there's a sample of how that is done. And Irina will talk more about that during her segment of the training. And then there's um, the timeline, the flow chart, the guide, this presentation, and a bunch of other stuff. So that's what's in the training materials SharePoint external folder. Okay, so so then am I safe to just simply discard the May 5th email uh, so that we don't get confused between two sets of templates? 
if you would prefer to use the templates and you haven't already started creating documents, if you would prefer to use the templates from the SharePoint folder, they are the same as what was sent to you in May. Okay, so either either method would be okay then it sounds like. Yes, sir. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much. Um, my second question is, is more general and, and it goes to um, the differences between the triennial and intervening code cycles. Are, are there any um, guidelines or, or um, criteria uh, that distinguish uh, code proposals Be, uh, uh, still yes, there, Derek. Uh, um, can you state that again? Your uh, the inter internet connection went wobbly there, and again, <laughs> you uh, okay. we lost your we lost your audio. Okay, that's fine. Um, is are there any differences in the allowable content um, code proposals that um, can be included in the rulemaking items for? either the triennial or the intervening code cycles? Do, do those code cycles impose any limits on the, the topics that could be included? Um, I'm not aware of anything that says that limits code proposals in the intervening versus the triennial. I mean, typically, well, during the triennial cycle, the, the model codes are adopted, but no, I'm not aware of any law or regulation that says, you know, you can only propose X, Y, Z in the intervening. Is, is there anything by, uh, by tradition that might uh, address the same question? By tradition, um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, is Mia on the line or Kevin, somebody? Mia's got her hand up. I think she might be in wanting to respond. Yeah, because I'm there not. She is. Go ahead, Mia. You're going, Derek. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, in, in, in the past, years and years in the past, there has been um, the idea, and this is not in law, is that the intervening code cycle is generally a cleanup. But what's been happening over the many cycles is there's there oftentimes is legislation where it's easier for a state agency to propose the, those rulemakings that are legislatively mandate during an intervening cycle. So they're not doing it during a triennial, but there's nothing in law that says uh, large rulemaking packages can't be submitted during an intervening. It's just been historically, it was a cleanup cycle, but we're seeing clearly in the last few code cycles, that's not the case. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mia. And I, I think the, to follow up on that, because I've had this conversation with uh, a couple of directors in the past, is they're asking, why are we doing a code cycle every 18 months? And the, uh, the law allows us to do that. But that doesn't mean that a state agency must do an intervening code cycle package unless they feel the need to do that based on legislation. <clears throat> Okay, great. Thank you. Uh huh. Sure. All right. Are there any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Anybody on the phone? Oh, Tom, go ahead. Huh? Yeah, this is Tom Martin with HCD. Um, and I totally agree with Mia, what she said. In the past, it has historically been that we just do clean up in the intervening. Um, and HCD this cycle will be doing a couple different code packages, but we will not be touching every code. So, yeah, it's, I think, preferred to do cleanup, but a lot of times there are things that will drive you to have to do a major rulemaking during the intervening. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right, so our poll question was, do you know your agency's deadline to obtain approval to submit your rulemaking package to CBSC? 65% uh, of you said yes, 
and 34% said no, but I will find out. So thank you for participating in the poll. And I will close that. And thank you, Brandon. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll have the next presenter up in just a moment. All right. Irina, are you here? Yes, I am here. Hey, Laura. Good morning, Irina. Morning, everybody. Uh, so, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. My name is Irina Brausman, Associate Architect with the California Building Standards Commission. I am going to talk about rulemaking cycle preparation and some of the required rulemaking documents. Uh, next slide, please. Let's start out by saying uh, state regulations should not be confused with state laws enacted through legislative process. Regulations are detailed rules needed to implement, interpret, and make specific the requirements of state law. Regulations are adopted by agencies in the executive branch of state government. Whenever state law requires or authorizes a state agency, to establish regulations, it will give that agency authority. Any regulations of the state agencies are <clears throat> adopted under the California Code of Regulations, which we refer to as SSR. <clears throat> Some of those regulations are in chapter four, in article four, in chapter one of the California Administrative Code. And that is provided in your electronic binder. You need to see sections 1-403 um, and through 1-415 and especially sections 1-403 about public participation, 1-407 uh, about initial submittal and uh, <clears throat> uh, further sections about public comment submittal and about final submittal. These sections include requirements for developing and submitting rulemaking documents to us for public review and publication at each stage of the rulemaking cycle. You can see there what documents are required at each phase and how many copies of each document we need. And there are also requirements about accessibility of the documents submitted. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is about ET. So what is that? And most here know what an ET is, so we are not going to spend a lot of time on that. But I want to cover a couple of basics. We all know that this is a document that shows the text of the regulation in strike out and underline format. We also know that the ET needs to be itemized to coordinate with ISOR. And each item needs to include a notation listing specific status or other provisions of law authorizing the adoption of the regulation and also specific status or other provisions of law being implemented, interpreted or made specific by that section of the law. Status listed in the ET notation have to be coordinated with status listed in the face sheet and NOPA as authorities and references. So they have to be the same. Uh, last cycle, we <clears throat> noticed that some of the submittals uh, lacked that coordination a little bit, and I wanted to emphasize that. Please make sure when you do ET, notation for authorities and references, coordinate that with a um, <clears throat> face sheet and NOPA also, as they need to have the same authorities and references on all three documents. And next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. I want to emphasize the importance of itemizing your proposed changes using 
our format that we provide in the template. This, this not only helps to maintain the accessibility of the document, but also provides the consistency we are looking for, for those following the process. I will talk a bit more about numbering format a bit later. So please do not modify the template. And that includes legend in the template also. If you have alternative format that you feel is critical to the success of your package, please discuss that with us prior to initial submittal. And short of that, we are looking to make the ETs all look and feel the same. This is the format that public seems to prefer, and it also ensures consistency across other proposing agency submittals. Then do not show existing amendments carried forward in their entirety, unless they are needed to show context for the section being proposed for change. And that includes existing deletions of the model text. There are <clears throat> several ways to show those existing amendments carried forward, and uh, uh, many of them are fine. I have several examples here. So it's fine to not show item at all and only have charging language in the ET and explanation in the ISOR for the item, indicating that all the existing amendments not shown here are to be moved forward without change. In that case, also providing a list of sections with amendments to move forward will help. It's also fine to only show a few words at the beginning of the section carried forward and a few words at the end with quotes and ellipses, or just show section number followed by the phrase, no change to existing amendment. Uh, by doing this, we tell the stakeholders that this is an amendment moving forward without change. <clears throat> then clearly indicate language that is moved to and from another place in the same code book. It should not be shown with strike out and underline as it is really existing language to be moved forward. What we find is the clearest way to show that is to have your charging language in the parentheses at the beginning and end of the text segment being moved, indicating where to and where from this text is being moved. Please, no shading or highlight, and please coordinate with other agencies if they are proposing the same move to indicate this change in the same way. And also make sure your charging language in the ET is brief and clearly express your intent. Later in step three, Beth will do more in-depth overview of the access issue uh, and um, how the documents are set up and answer questions related to the format of the templates. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, Irina, we have a hand raised. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ryan. Do... Thanks. Yeah, I had a question regarding the last part of the previous slide regarding mm -hmm. the accessible content. Sometimes modifications are being made to model code elements, and the model code elements or reference standards. Uh, might not be accessible and we're uncertain how to approach those. Are there recommendations for that? Uh, so we will talk about accessibility in the last segment of this training. But I would say that if uh, there are certain problems with accessibility and um, I know if we, for example, if we talk about tables, then Beth will address that in depth, but we can also discuss that kind of for particular examples later, I would say. And uh, yeah, let's, let's wait till the last segment uh, with accessibility questions, if that's fine. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. 
there are no other hands raised. Oh, wait. <clears throat> Emily, Emily raised her hand as I was saying. Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, this is Emily Withers with HCD. Um, if I could ask a clarifying question, when you say charging language, is that the language you're indicating as no change to existing amendment that we put at the end of the paragraph? Or are you talking about the language that we used to put in the front that would say something to the effect of um, HCD proposes to continue adoption of chapter three with the following amendments? Do we still need that language that says HCD continue for the intervening? HCD continues to adopt with the following amendments. Do we need that? Uh, hi, Emily. I would say it helps. So, like when you have a, a item number and then the chapter, for example, and uh, after the chapter in the normal text, if you can just give you intent for this whole chapter or the whole section. And that can be brief, really brief, but that helps us and it helps all the kind of stakeholder reviewing uh, the package because it immediately from the beginning gives an idea what the intent for the item. And the charging language is also uh, the language that in parentheses indicate no change or move to somewhere or move from somewhere, that's basically also charging language. Okay, thank you. Um, when we looked at the templates, we weren't sure if that initial uh, sentence should be in the, the ET because it didn't look like it was formatted that way. And I know that some agencies just go directly into the proposed strikeout underscore language without the rest of the, we we, Mm -hmm. proposed to continue adoption of this chapter except for you know mm -hmm. but it doesn't have that sentence in front yeah emily it's not required to have that charge in language but it helps and um i think if i am not mistaken beth has a slide later in her part that shows that if i am not mistaken but we can go back to your question when we get to that in the in the last segment of the training. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Beth? Ahead, Beth. Yeah, Emily, I do have a slide. You're correct, Irina. Mm -hmm. I do have a mm -hmm. slide that um, I will cover that for you. So yeah. look forward to it then. So and uh, Emily, after that slide, if you still have questions about that, we can discuss at that point more. Okay, Emily and Beth, if you're done, will you please lower your hands? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so now we are at the eyesore slide. So the eyesore tells the reader why this proposed change needs to be moved forward. The description of what this proposed change is may be included, but it's not enough. The law specifies what must be stated in the ISOR. So, and that includes the reason it became a code change purpose, what the problem is that the change is designed to address, the rationale, <clears throat> rationale for having it in place and benefit it will yield. All four have to be included in the ISOR. And the explanation uh, needs to be quite specific. In other words, phrases like to align, to clarify, to provide clarity, or to promote consistency are not acceptable entries for the ISOR. While all of these phrases may be true, they are not very descriptive for the reader. If you feel the need to say to clarify, simply elaborate on what is being clarified and why it wasn't clear prior to the change. What happened to cause the need to clarify? And by clarifying it, does it provide a benefit? So it needs to be specific explanation of why this change needs to be moved forward 
not just exploration kind of explanation of what that change is. And uh, CBSC staff has to check for complete statements. So again, be thorough, explain the purpose for the change, the problem that you are trying to solve and rationale for change and any benefits the change would provide. Also, the ISOR prepared for 45-day comment period must contain CAC recommendations, comments, and your responses, not just the net effect changes on the ET. It has to show reasoning. Remember, transparency is critical to a successful package and the good rulemaking. So a clear summary within the ISOR of the CAC recommendation and the agency response to those recommendations is very important. And next slide, please. So, and I am not going to talk a lot about things on this slide. Basically, that shows, again, importance of itemizing your proposed changes using CBSC template format without modifying it and correlation between ET and ISOR. Next slide, please. So here we'll talk a little bit about final statement of reason. Uh, per government section 1146.9, the FSOR is an update of the information contained in the initial statement of reason and the summary of each objection or recommendation made regarding the proposed changes, together with explanation of how the proposed action has been changed to accommodate each objection or recommendation or the reasons for making no change. This is not an update to information contained in the ET or explanation of changes happened in the ET. If you have doubts on what to include and not to include in the FSOR section, updates to the initial statement of reason, ask yourself what was included in the ISOR and if the statement in question is an update to that. Do not list all the changes that happened in the ET because of the public comments received or because of any other reasons if this section, <clears throat> in this section of the FSOR. If there was an objection or recommendation from the public, it belongs in objections or recommendations made regarding the proposed regulation section of FSOR only. Um, next slide, please. And uh, <clears throat> here are several more items to pay attention to when formatting your ET and ISOR. In, it, in <clears throat> itemizing your ET and ISOR, use ascending order by chapter or section or article. And uh, text import and modification. We have Word documents available for your use that contains the latest code language. However, we encourage you to not copy paste the whole text where are no changes if not needed to understand the context. And uh, the reason for that, when we use copy paste from something, from something accidentally, we can use the wrong version or we can push their own button, or we can do something. And then in the ET, we'll get the language that's marked as an existing language that's not really existing language. And that brings confusion later during the process. So if you do not need something for context, uh, that something is not really necessary in the ET, just don't copy paste the whole thing. Um, then regarding the footer information in the template, 
uh, read the footer and fill out the information asked for. It's listed on this slide. Uh, and uh, we could not make field forms in the footer, unfortunately. So ma to make it more clear in the template. So please read it carefully and fill out all the information necessary. Also, please change the date in the footer every time and only when you change something in the document and send it to us. That helps us a lot to track different versions of the documents and serves as an indication that something got changed in the document. As there was some confusion last cycle <clears throat> uh, when we had two identical documents with different dates or the opposite of that, we had identical date in the footer, but the document was actually different. So if you could please change the date only and when you have changes and you send those changes to us, that helps a lot. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a hand raised, Irina. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Lindsay. Hi, Irina. Quick question about the date. Um, when you said that uh, agencies um, have to change date when there are changes in the document. So I'm looking at the example TP121, the initial express terms. What, what determines the date? Like I, I, I understand the month and the year, that's easy, but is the date change determined by the date? We send the email with the attachment to CBSC or is it determine different differently? So basically, when you send the first version to us as an initial submittal, you have the date in the footer. And that date can be your internal date, or it can be the date when you send the submittal. It doesn't really matter to us, but it has the date. Then we review the package. And um, in many cases, we have comments that need to be resolved. So we send you comments back. Then you send us updated version. And in that updated version, the date need to be different. And again, it can be your internal date. It can be the date when you send it to us. But it needs to be the different date from the first version. That gives us later kind of indication when we look at two versions of the same document that, OK, this is the earlier version. It was modified later by this document, and this is the latest version. OK, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, no comments. Julie, um, I see Julie is unmuted. Did you want to say something? Okay. Okay, so I continue then. Yes, shall I change the slide for you? Um, yes, please. Okay. Okay. So we assign rulemaking package numbers when the agencies submit their initial packages for any given cycle. A package is normally given <clears throat> Uh, four part, sometimes two parts, sometimes there are more than one package assigned to a given part. And the rulemaking number is not related to the part they address or the date when they are submitted. It does, however, identify the order in which the packages are submitted to CBSC. In the example shown on this slide, the rulemaking file number is BSC-01-22, where a BSC is the acronym of the proposing agency. The first number, 01, indicates the first package received from this proposing agency, in this case, BSC, regardless of the part it's intended to address. And the next number for this cycle uh, is 22, indicates the cycle year of hey, that hey, proposal. Hey, hey, hey. No. 
I can't see who that is. It might be somebody on the phone. <laughs> Go ahead. So when we create CAMs, we add two more numbers to the rulemaking file number to get an assigned number to each proposed amendment. We use these numbers in CAM. As you see in the example, the next two numbers are six and two. So, and number six is a very important number as we get it directly from your ET. And the last number is two, and we add it if there is more than one proposed amendment within the ET item. We encourage you to use this simple format in itemizing your proposals. It makes things more complicated when we work with different formats that uses letters with numbers, decimals, dashes, and other symbols. The easiest way is to itemize your ET by chapter, or if the whole proposal includes just one chapter, itemize by main sections. If you want to use a different format, please discuss it with us first, as it benefits everyone to have as much consistency between all documents as possible. And uh, if there is a benefit to group the related items for ease of review, please create a list of the grouped items. If the list is provided, it should be submitted with the submittal package and must be in accessible format. We have included in your training materials a copy of a list for SFM part two submittal from the last cycle as an example. And uh, <clears throat> the reason we ask to submit this grouped item hmm, list uh, with, uh, with the whole submit submittal package is that when we provide these documents to uh, CAC members or commission members or to someone for review, if we do not provide grouped items from the beginning, they start to review their ISOR or CAM or just order they are listed in the ISOR. And when we provide grouped items later, it just confuses things. They don't have, they usually don't have time to switch the order of, review, of reviewing things. So if you have, if you feel there is a benefit of group items, please do that from the beginning and still list items in ascending order in your ET and ISOR, but in addition to that, have a list of grouped items. Erin, uh, we have a raised hand. Um, okay. Derek. Derek. Great, thank you. Um, Irina, historically, the Division of the State Architect has submitted rulemaking packages under two banners, two different banners to Building Standards Commission. Uh, the first being uh, DSA SS mm -hmm. and the second being DSA AC. Um, with, with this slide um, and your comments, are, are you suggesting that we should no longer include the dash SS and dash AC as oh. separate packages, but simply have them all listed under DSA? No, 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 Derek. Um... Uh, sorry if you miss uh, if 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 I was not clear on that. So DSS dash SS that's part of the name of the agency. So that is totally fine to have dashes, slashes, whatever the name is. I was talking about number of the item. Like in the ET, when you look at that, there is item one, item two, three, and so on. So the complications may arise if we start numbering items like item one dash three dash a whatever. So that creates a long number. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> when we go to CAM, we need to adjust our format to include all those sub numbers of the number that's in the ET. So that's only about that. Your agency name is fine with dashes and slashes and 
whatever. Okay, that's that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know DSAAC has submitted packages before where our item numbers took the format of 11B.01, 11B.02, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so I understand that that's not uh, desirable within DSA's submittal package. We'll change that um, in, that, in the cycle. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Great. Thank you, Irina. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, going back to my presentation. So during the <clears throat> this intervening cycle, we will accept electronic submittals through SharePoint instead of sending the files through email. We are still working on the structure for that, but that's basically the plan. And um, <clears throat> we started testing this method with, um, I think, with the DSA. And uh, uh, later, we'll probably need to test this with some other agency also, how that works, how that new structure works. Because uh, we want to make the process as easy as possible for everyone and uh, kind of easily monitored. So the SharePoint looks to be the correct way to go. We are still working on the structure for that. We'll, we'll should get your more information closer to the initial submittal date. But the intent is to use SharePoint instead of emailing uh, your packages to certain staff members of uh, Building Standard Commission. And uh, one important note to that, same as with the email submittals we had <clears throat> during previous cycle, those files that you submit through emails or SharePoint or <laughs> whatever system uh, we have or use, those files are not formal submittals. We still need hard copies for the rulemaking file, file record. So once the files are reviewed, finalized, and post it on the web at each phase. We then need the formal submittal, hard copies, uh, meaning paper copies and CD or USB with electronic files at the end of each phase of the rulemaking. So hard copies are still required. There are some exceptions to that. For example, if your ET is really huge, like more than 100 pages, 200 pages. Uh, we can talk with you and uh, do not have paper copy printed, but have <clears throat> that file on the CD or on the USB. So that's basically to save on travel time, delivery time, and uh, save on paper. We don't want to waste tons of paper on sending submittals back and forth, but we still need the formal paper and um, CD USB copy for the record. And I think that's it for me. So right. we are at the Q&A. Any questions? It looks like we answered the questions as we went through, but we do have another poll. Let's see, I have to find poll question number two. Hmm. Well, Zoom is continuing to be cantankerous today. So I think we can just, um, how about before our next segment, we take a break. And then when we come back, it will be Kevin talking about the 399 and the NOVAC. So let's take a break until uh, 9.45.
and we'll see everybody back at that time. Oh, it did come up. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, and that was, and also I wanted to know that even if you don't have questions for my section or for Brendan's section at this point, you may have think about more questions later. So we are here and uh, we can answer them at the end of the whole training kind of at the end after the last segment. So if you have more questions, keep them. We'll answer them at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Okay, we're gonna pause for a uh, 11 minute break. Hi, everybody. We're back from break and I'm gonna get started in just a minute here. And it's, it's actually 9.45, not 10.45. Yeah, sorry about that last slide. We didn't intend to advertise an hour break, just 10 minutes. We're recording. Yes. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, there's the thing. Okay, cool. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Day, and I'm a staff services manager with the California Building Standards Commission. Today, I'll be presenting step two information to be entered on the form 399 and the notice of proposed action or NOVA. Next slide, please. Okay, so two of the documents required for the rulemaking submittals are the NOPA and the Economic and Fiscal Impact Statement, or Form 399. The NOPA is the legal document that advises the public of the plan to adopt new or amended building standards. This document also contains cost information that is consistent with the 399. The Form 399 reflects various public, private, economic, and fiscal impacts a proposed building standard would have on the regulated community. Please review Article 4 in Chapter 1 of the California Administrative Code for required documents in each phase of the rulemaking process and the required number of copies. Next slide, please. So much of the information required in the NOPA summarizes more detailed information that may be found in the Form 399 and any attachments to it. The NOPA is filed with the Office of Administrative Law for purposes of publication in the California Regulatory Notice Register only and is not subject to OAL review. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're looking at a little snapshot of, uh, of the NOPA template. You'll notice in your materials we have included uh, the NOPA template, which I will not cover in its entirety. Rather, I'd like to go over specific sections that relate to the 399. If you look at page three of the NOPA, you'll see the following section. This section requires an estimate of cost or savings to school districts, state and local agencies, and other costs. These cost estimates come directly from the Form 399 and should be consistent. Next slide, please. I have a hand raised. Okay. Crystal? Go ahead, Crystal. Yeah. I don't know if it's me, but all I see on the screen is uh, CS, like uh, CBSC staff has started sharing screen and like a circle. Oh, interesting. I'm I seeing the whole screen. I, I see the slide. Okay. So I see the slide name. as well. This is step okay. two, form 399 in NOPA. Okay. It's my end then. Okay. I'll, I'll try and fix it. Thank you. Sorry about that, Crystal. Maybe, maybe just hit, try a refresh on your Zoom, Crystal, maybe. Okay, we will do. Thanks. Okay, and then I think we're on the next slide. Okay. Okay. At the bottom of the same page is the section about impact to business. In short, a proposing agency must determine if the building standard will or will not have a significant statewide adverse economic impact on businesses. Again, much of this information is also required in the 399 and should be consistent. If a significant impact is identified, specific information is required to be entered here, uh, including the impact to the types of businesses, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. 
Okay. There is also the possibility that an agency determines the standard will not have a significant impact. On page four of the NOPA template, a state agency must include very thorough information justifying its determination of no significant impact to business. This declaration of evidence section requires an agency to provide in the record facts, evidence, documents, testimony, and other evidence relied upon. CBSC was recently involved in a lawsuit where it was determined that its declaration of evidence was not sufficient. As such, proposing agencies must include in this section of the NOPA sufficient information that justifies its determination of no significant effect on business. This may appear as a summary of workshops, emails, testimony, studies, information included in the 399 and or its attachments, summarized here as the evidence. Without this information, a state agency's rulemaking may be challenged for not complying. Next slide, please. For not complying with the APA, that is, the Administrative Procedure Act. Okay. There are other sections on this page that require information on the impact to the regulated community, such as the finding of necessity for public health, safety, welfare, and uh, other cost impacts to private persons, business, et cetera. Next slide, please. Page five of the NOPA requires an agency to assess the effect of regulations on job creation, job elimination, et cetera. This information is also required on the 399 and should be consistent. There are instructions for how to complete this and other sections in the State Administrative Manual, section 6603. Next slide, please. Page five of the NOPA requires an agency to provide estimated cost of compliance that would impact housing and consideration of any alternatives considered by the agency information that should also be consistent with the 399. So now that we've looked at some of these sections of the NOPA, we'll switch gears and we'll look at the form 399. Next slide, please. So a form 399 is also known as the Economic and Fiscal Impact Statement and is required by the Administrative Procedure Act to address the cost of regulations and any potential impact the regulations may have on private sector, as well as impact on state and local government through the fiscal impact of the regulations. In other words, there are two main topics to cover in the 399, the economic and the fiscal. Next slide, please. So here we have an example of a completed 399 cover sheet. Um, you may want to uh, jump ahead to this in your materials just so you can see it clearly, but if you can see on the screen, note how in this Building Standards Commission example, we indicated the estimated private sector costs in Section A. Uh, so we indicated some specific impacts to business and or employees, small businesses, jobs, occupations, um, imposes prescriptive. So we, we estimated some or we indicated some estimated private sector cost impacts. However, if your agency identifies no private sector cost impacts, you would check the H box where it says none of the above and then explain below. If you check the H, the H box, then the form directs you to skip the rest of the first part of the 399, the economic impact assessment, and jump right to the fiscal impact section on page four. This is important because sometimes agencies will mark age for no private sector costs, but then start filling out parts of that, uh, the economic impact assessment anyway. You know, so there's there's been some confusion there, but yeah, basically if you check H, you just jump right to page four, the fiscal impact. Next slide, please. Okay, so on pages one through three of the 399, the economic impact statement, there's a section A, which asks for the estimated private sector costs. This would be the total economic impact of the regulation in dollars, as well as the impact on business, jobs, competitiveness, and individuals. 
Section B uh, asks for the estimated costs to comply with the proposed regulation, costs to housing, and any comparable federal regulations. Section C asks for the estimated benefits, which include health and welfare of, of California citizens and expansion of business. And Section D, alternatives to the regulation, asks for a list of any alternatives the agency may have considered, benefits of the regulation and of those alternatives considered, and the benefits of or alternatives for performance or prescriptive standards. Next slide, please. Okay, so on page three at the very bottom, there's section E, which concerns major regulations. It is important to note that because building standards are not subject to OAL review, they do not meet the definition and are not considered major regulations. This means a building standard only needs to include an economic and fiscal impact statement, Form 399, not the standardized regulatory impact analysis required for major regulations, which is covered in a different section of the APA and is a much more uh, thorough and extensive uh, analysis. Um, so back to the, the fact that building standards are not ever considered major regulations, uh, we've seen some good examples from the Energy Commission and the Department of Housing, I'm sorry, uh, the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, um, this past cycle did a good job of kind of highlighting this and summarizing it in their 399 and attachments. Next slide, please. So on pages four and five of the 399, all these fiscal impacts would result in a cost or savings that affect the overall state budget. These are sections that, if indicated on a 399, would necessitate DOF, concur that's Department of Finance, concurrence and signature. And again, the State Administrative Manual sections 6604 to 6616 uh, have some information on this. Next slide, please. And that uh, pretty much covers uh, the connection between the NOPA um, the, and elements of the ISOR and the 399, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Emily has her hand raised. Hi, Emily, go ahead. Hi, Kevin. Um, I have a question. This is Emily from HCD. Um, when we look at some regulations, some are like optional items. For example, Cal Green is a real good example. But we have no way of knowing how many local jurisdictions will actually adopt that option. So how do we address that? And I know um, Department of Finance wants us to address fiscal impacts related to, you know, even option or voluntary measures, but we have no idea of how many jurisdictions would be adopting it and how many structures would be impacted. Yeah, that's a good question, Emily. I think um, the best way to go about that, especially if it's, you know, an option, like you said, or, or a voluntary provision, uh, would be to go through the 399 to see what cost impact uh, data you can um, enter, you know, through the, the um, engagement with the public, you know, if they adopt it. So even if you don't know how many jurisdictions might adopt that voluntary provision, you can check with some, you know, and, and just kind of see what kind of data is out there, what, what data is available. Um, I know that the state administrative manual has a cost methodology estimating tool uh, in the SAM that, that you can use. It's pretty complex, but like that's kind of the information that DOF is looking for. And then if, if you've got any other questions while you're generating the data in the 399, um, in some cases, we've had to reach out to the Department of Finance, you know, just to ask them questions. So I think it's just the agencies just need to do their best due diligence in entering as much information as there are. And if not, it allows for assumptions and you just need to kind of provide whatever background data the agency found in making those assumptions. So that's that's pretty much the tack that we've taken um, at BSC. And, and we always, where we often get questions from Department of Finance and there's like an ongoing dialogue with them. So um, hopefully that helps. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I don't see any other hands raised. So I'm gonna try to do another poll here. Sure. Uh, 
Pull. We're trying for one more <laughs> poll. We're going to see if the poll gods are with us. They've been they've been a little testy this morning. Launch. Okay, try again. Aha. There we go. Zoom wants me to click everything three times. Oh dear. They want you to be sure. Everybody waited for you so they could watch you, and then they. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so oh, okay. it looks like there might be some confusion on this, Kevin. Um, okay. I, I'm seeing about half and half answering this question true, and half and half answering the question false. Oh yeah, it didn't go through. So yeah, again, like if in the first part of the 399, the economic impact assessment. You would only complete those the the fields in those first three pages if you checked any of the boxes a I think it's a through G um, because then what you've indicated is that there would be an economic impact to the private sector whether it's to cost uh, jobs businesses private persons etc then you'd have to continue through filling out those pages if you don't check a through G and you check H where it says uh, no private costs. Uh, impacts and then all you would do is below because it asks you to explain like for example if uh, like the building standards commission um, in a given cycle does a plumbing code submittal where it's just kind of code cleanup you know where we're just uh, doing things that would have no uh, change in regulatory effect where we're just cleaning up uh, you know some items uh, providing clarity consistency whatever and there's no new requirements you know that that uh, would would impose a new regulation on the regulated community um, we check H and then you don't need to do the rest of the economic impact assessment the first part of the 399 you'd skip right to the fiscal impact um, and then you know determine if the the regulation would have any uh, cost uh, that would affect the state budget you know state agencies um, uh, local agencies that get reimbursed by the state, federally funded programs, etc. So, if you mark, if you check H, you don't, you can skip ahead. You don't need to do the rest of the economic impact assessment. If you check any of the others, you do. Isn't it page like four? They go down to. I think if they page, check H. Yeah, if you check H, you can skip pass go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the correct answer to this question is true. True. I know it's a tough one. <laughs> yep. That's why we put it in there. Yep. All right. Just to make sure everybody got that. Okay. No other questions? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Now, Beth Maynard. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good morning, and thanks for hanging in there. So I am Beth Maynard. I am an associate construction analyst here at the Building Standards Commission, and I will be going over the document accessibility compliance portion of this training. If you have, we don't have chat, Never mind. If you have any questions, go ahead, raise your hand during the presentation. We can stop and answer at that time. Next slide. Okay. So this is step three, document accessibility compliance. So for people with disabilities, website accessibility and other forms of accessible technology are necessities, not luxuries or conveniences. That fosters independence, economic self-sufficiency and active meaningful participation in civic life. ADA applies to such digital spaces the lack of specific requirements or technical, boy, this would help, or te technical compliance standards incorporated in regulation has led to a widespread lack of meaningful digital accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, on June 10th, there was a letter issued, uh, a push on DOJ to ensure all federal, state, and local government websites comply with the ADA. DOJ to expeditiously 
pursue regulatory and additional sub-regulatory initiatives under titles two and three of the, of the ADA to ensure that state and local governments and public accommodations uh, procure design, maintain and use websites, mobile applications, online systems, and other forms of information and communication technology that are accessible to and usable by the widest range of people with disabilities possible. So we, so I don't, this doesn't sound right. Promo, pro, can't even say it. Updated regulations that include clear and enforceable accessibility and usability standards that align with current regulate requirements under Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, to clarify that current regulations apply to websites, online systems, mobile applications, and other forms of information and communication, regardless of whether a covered entity also owns or operates a physical location offering the same or similar goods, services, or information. This will ensure uniform and consistent implementation of the ADA across the country. In your training materials on SharePoint, there are copies of all the documents necessary for submittal packages. We also added instructional template for the ET and ISOR. Templates have been updated for this cycle and were provided to the agencies after the coordinating council meeting. And we can send those again to those of you that need them. Please, you know, please let us know if you need any of these um, templates. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Where's my mouse? Okay, listed here are the tools that are available to assist you with your compliance for documents. There is a website for the Department of Rehabilitation, which has resources for creating accessible content within your documents, standards for, standards for WCA. There are the built-in tools that come with Word and PDF, but remember these tools only check about 30% of the issues. The other 70% have to be manually checked. To check accessibility within Word, over to where it says file, click down to info, the third box down, check for issues, inspect document, and then check accessibility. This provides an accessibility inspection report. What you want to see is no accessibility issues found. People with disabilities should not have any difficulty reading this document if that's the case. When manually checking PDF, on the right side of the screen, list all the tools provided for the PDF documents. Look for accessibility. Click and select accessibility check. This runs through the complete document and provides, if any, a list of issues. Another option is to identify any accessibility issues using the screen reader. See, I use the screen reader to read through my documents this I have found can help find the underlying issues that may not be visible to the eye. The color contrast tool used to determine the contrast when use, using colors or gradients. Accessible Color Picker Chrome extension downloads from Google developed by the Level Access and a software application color contrast analyzer, which is downloadable from TPGI's website. And um, I believe they're all, I, it's installed on my computer. So I'm not sure if all you have it, if that was just something that went through the whole state to, that they offered. So, so here at CBSC, we use the NVDA, which is the reader for our documents, which is a great tool. Again, this really helps to identify any issues that may not be easily identified by just viewing the documents. And here it, it, uh, it's, Building Standards Commission, we do a lot of additional work to these documents to help get them in compliance for accessibility. We really need for the state agencies to take ownership of their documents regarding ensuring compliance with accessibility requirements. That would help us at uh, CBSC with the time limitations we have during each of these cycles. Next slide, please. <coughs> Pardon me. Lizzie has her hand raised. 
Go ahead. Hi, um, I just wanted to mention that um, in your current slide, the link um, from DOR, uh -huh. it, um, I try accessing the page and it says page does not exist or not available. Uh, All right, we'll get you a good link, Lindsay. Thanks for letting us know. My apologies, and yeah, thank you. No problem. Next, next slide. Yes. yes, please. There you go. Okay. Uh, this here is the document checklist. It's another very useful tool that the CBSC staff uses to manually check the accessibility compliance of both your PDF and Word documents. Skip the categories that don't apply. So like if you're just checking, you know, sometimes you don't have tables or you don't have some of the other items that are listed in there, then, you know, we just skip those. Um, this document is a companion. This document has a companion document with the agency submittal resource document, which has the WCAG um, standards within it. The Roman numerals can coincide with the checklist provided for you on SharePoint. The resource document provides more information, explanations on each of the items listed within the checklist. This tool takes you through all the necessary steps to check for compliance. The structure of your PDF and or Word document is, re is reviewed for the tags, headings, reading order, bookmarks, tables, graphics, layout format, color contrast, links, titles, and finally the language of the document. It's a very thorough checklist, which is available to utilize for your accessibility checks prior to your submitting to um, CBSC. A couple items to note, underlined items not in express terms or shading or highlighting out items are not an accessibility compliance. If any changes are made, recheck the document and run the accessibility checker once the changes are made. Changes, changes sometimes, when you make changes, it sometimes brings up other problems. Next slide. So starting off with our express terms. Here it's showing the heading level one. So we always wanna keep this as heading level one and what's best to do is when you bring up our new template, just enter the information in the shaded areas. So, but what you wanna do before starting a new submittal packet, check your documents to ensure that you are working with the most current template that BSC has available. In the bottom left corner within the footer has the revision date. And I believe it all should have May of 21 or have you updated 22? Hi, we're in 22. Yeah. It should have any, anywhere from May of 22 to current date. Yeah, I believe it's May. Uh, Ryan has his hand up. Hi, Ryan. Hello, I have a question on the last slide with regards to the last, I think it was the last couple of items regarding tables with for the header rows and merged cells. Sometimes the model reference, sometimes the model code or reference standards may violate the, the requirements here and yeah what are we supposed to do in those situations? Because if we were to modify it to try and make it accessible, it looks like we're trying to make more modifications than what is really the case. Yeah, I know we've run into that problem quite a bit here. And I think what we do is, and and Carol, um, I know you're on, Carol is our expert resident on, on all of this. Um, Carol, would you like to, chime in on this one. I know you might have be able to answer it better than myself. Hi, y'all. I apologize. I was looking into the problem with the link on the DOR website and missed the question. <laughs> Would you mind repeating it? Sure. So with regards to the current slide shown and the information about tables, the lower, the last two rows, if you will, the, the header row and merged cells, sometimes the model code or the reference standard May violate, may, may violate the requirements listed. And if we wanted to be making modifications to that table, how are we supposed to still comply with this if the model or reference 
standard uh, violates it, if we were to try and make modifications to meet these ADA requirements, it's going to look like we're making changes that are not actually the case that are really substantive. Right. Um, that's problematic because some of the existing code was put in place before these requirements were part of the part of the scenery. Uh, there are ways of going in behind the scenes and just defining merged cells and uh, and getting it very explicit on the back side, which doesn't change how it looks to the user at all. It just changes how the machine is, is interpreting it. They're kind of involved and probably not for a beginner to try to deal with. The header row is usually easier, but but quite frankly, some of some of the tables that exist just are too complex to translate easily into accessible formats. We're having to deal with those kind of one on one. And sometimes there's just only so much you can do. It's our job to do it to the best of our ability and where where it's possible to to make it compliant where it's not it's very difficult. You can't go in and change what exists in a way that is not consistent with, with, um, with what they would find if they went to the code somewhere else. Hey, Carol. Our requirement, this, yeah. This is Laura. Hey, Laura. So um, I think there's a couple things that can be done um, for for the ET for us for posting um, is to just maybe have a, a snip of the top of the table if you're not uh, amending that part of it and then use alt text on that and then uh, use ellipsis for any parts of the table that you're not modifying and then only have an actual real table built that is the text that you are changing and then ellipsis for any remaining parts of the table. So, so there are workarounds where you don't have to recreate the entire inaccessible table and uh, using a, a snip with alt text can be one of those solutions. Um, if what you're rebuilding requires uh, merge cells or any of those types of things, there are there are methods for doing that where um, you actually unmerge the cells and you have white text um, so that it's repeated the the uh, the row information is repeated for each row appropriately and stuff like that. So there are ways that the um, Department of Rehabilitation actually addresses that. There's also a Department of Technology class, advanced class that teaches how to build those tables. Um, but if you guys have a specific table that you want worked on, um, and you just can't figure it out, then you can, you know, give us a call and see if, if we can help. But uh, you can you can use different workarounds besides, you know, trying to go in the back end because not not everybody can be a programmer. We just have to work with what we have. So, did you have anything to add to that, Carol? Um, <clears throat> as a personal rule, I try to avoid the hidden text thing and just use call span and roll span. But but the, the bottom line of what you came to is the same. If it gets past what you can figure out with the resources that you have available online, ping us and we'll work with you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. So we we formatted all our uh, document templates, our express terms, ISOR, uh, to be consistent for all cycles, the initial, the 45 day, and the uh, 45 or 15 day additional. 
and the finals. I don't think I can do next slide. <laughs> Just a second. My next slide person stepped away. Okay, the express terms template, we have two legends, each that reflect different parts of the code. You need to select one of the legends that reflects the code that you are amending. Just make sure you delete the other legend and the highlighted note. Do not paste a legend in from another code source to, or another source document or an old template. Last cycle, there was a lot of copying and pasting occurring and this tends to mess up the accessibility within the document. Next slide, please. Okay, I was just confirming the uh, revision date on all of our templates is 0322. Same that was in the, uh, the slide. Thank you. The body of the express terms keeps the format that is shown here and put your information for each item, chapter, and section number. Keeping this format helps navigate this document and also helps the CDSC staff when we create the numbering for the CAMs. These headings are indicated heading level two and three. The express terms language is formatted in a normal style. You can copy and paste from another source document. As long as you um, copy and paste inside that gray section and only the content. A note about copying and pasting, please be sure when you are copy and pasting that you are using the most current document that had no errors for accessibility. We found last year that the same errors were carried forward for each of the submittals, like from, from the initial submittal to 45 day to final. So it's really important that um, you use the most current accessible sheet or accessible template or accessible form that you submitted to us. Um, this year, if we are using SharePoint, uh, this will hold the most current document. What happens in our office when you when your agencies submit a submittal package to us, it goes through the tech staff to begin the review of the documents uh, for accessibility and the content. When we have completed our review, our in-house expert, Carol, <laughs> who will review again, um, she reviews the accessibility again prior to posting on the website. And um, most often times she finds still more errors. So um, I know last year when that happened with me, when I found more errors and either fixed them or sent them back to you, when I fixed them, I emailed you the document and that to replace the document that you submitted to us. So if that happens, um, but this year it's, it's SharePoint. So if we update the documents and we put them back on SharePoint, maybe take them off of SharePoint to put in to use for the next submittal. If that's making sense at all. Is there any questions or anybody? No hands raised right now. Okay, next slide. Okay, here what we recommend is to copy and paste this section in your document. So when you get open your template and you have um, your item, chapter, section, and then insert express terms language. What I do is how it works out for me. I take uh, chapter one, Division one, if I have any items that I'm moving, I use all of chapter one under one item. This is just what works for me. It doesn't mean you have to do it. And then uh, chapter one, division two, I'll, I'll start a new item. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll copy and paste item, chapter, section, insert, express terms, language. I'll copy and paste that over and over again. 
but then I won't, I'll take out the item if I'm adding just chapters within the same chapter. If this is making sense. I know I explained things um, a little difficult to follow me. Um, you can incorporate many sections under one item as needed. For express term language, you can copy and paste this portion from another source. Just make sure that you've clicked on the gray insert express terms language and paste within that. <clears throat> Remember when you select paste, be sure you merge the formatting. That way it brings the text over and keeps the document you are working on in the original source format. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We have a raised hand. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Crystal. Yeah, it's just um, important to know that for even the CAC or in the commission, um, when they vote on items, if you have too many things and then there's one thing in that one item, the whole item is part of the further study or the discussion. Actually, what we do is when we when we get your documents and we make the CAMs, the commission actions, and we'll have item, but then we'll give them a separate number beside that. So it'll be like item number one dash one, item number one dash two for each of the different, uh, say different sections within that, underneath that item. So they can take, oh. Yeah, they can take and vote on each of the because we did that with uh, almost everybody's. I know last year, I believe, Crystal, you had an item for each. Yes, we did, because there were certain items that, you know, we didn't want to lose the whole thing right, based on right. that. But I didn't know that you that that's new to me, that Building Standards Commission will separately itemize each um section number within the item yeah so as many item as many chapters or, or sections you have underneath an item we'll give that item one like i said item one dash one item one dash two and then when we go to the, your next item it'll be like item two dash one item two i think um mia has her hand raised and maybe uh Irina might want to chime in on this okay Go ahead, Mia. Hi, thanks. Th uh, good question, Crystal. And this is one of those gray areas and nuance areas because sometimes all of those subsections are related to the main section. And so it might behoove the code advisory committee to make a recommendation other than approve and it should apply to all those subsections. But um, Beth is correct, and it, 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 it depends on how the rulemaking is submitted. But let's just say someone submitted uh, the definitions chapter, and it's called item two. But there's maybe 13 different definitions that are being amended in the commission action table. Those would be all be under item two, but as Beth pointed out, they would the the co commission action matrix, excuse me, would have a subsection. So it would be two dash one, two dash two, two dash three, and so on. And so the code advisory committee or the commission could pick and choose through there, and they may concur to approve most of those definitions, but they may have a another. Um, recommendation for the other definitions, and those can be parsed out separately. Um, so I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Yes, for me that does, um, because that wasn't clear that Building Standards Commission would do that in the last cycle with the new templates for the items. So um, we did group some, you know, in, in our items, but we didn't do whole chapters as, you know, like chapter one is one item, chapter two is item two. Um, you know, we, we definitely did two dash one ourselves mm -hmm. based on, um, 
you know, what we felt needed to be grouped or separated. Um, but now I know that Building Standards Commission will do that. That saves me some time. Well, so. and, and I, would, I, would, I would, as a follow up to that, I, I would just say, you know, maybe before you start itemizing everything is to, to talk through that a little bit with the tech staff, because it, it might make sense for the State Fire Marshal's Office to do that because they want to ensure certain things are together. And right. BSC staff might not know the importance of that, right? Um, right. Uh, so, so yeah, that's something we could talk out ahead. Yeah. Uh, the other thing too is is I think in in look re, trying to remember the size of some of the documents is you know again the the itemized information on the ET and the ISOR um, could again let's just say for example chapter two that's kind of an easy one I know chapter four is a little bit more difficult because you might have different subjects within chapter four. Um, is if they're if they're all under one item, let's just say they're all item two, uh, and and BSC creates the CAM that separates those out. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. What that does is in the ET and the ISOR, it doesn't take up as much room because item two, and then you have a list of all the definitions, um, and rather than having it say item two dash one spelling it all out again, item 2-2, spelling it all out again. That is a lot of text uh, that might not be necessary in the ET and the ISOR. So that's another thought too. Right. These are some of those nuances, right? <clears throat> kind of like uh, the good question by DSA about the graying out of uh, certain things uh, because of code change language. So these are uh, nuances. So um, just to be more specific going forward for, you know, we have our existing building um, work group that they're working diligently to try and get a package together for the other um, state agencies to look at once um, we have that work group kind of finished up. And so the direction I gave them for their chapters six through 11 was to itemize um, the section. So like if there's section um, 601, because that reason statement is gonna be different than 602 and 603. So in, in that case, we, we probably would do our sub numbers. So we'd have 6-1, 6-2, so that the ET and ISOR correlate if that makes sense. But the individual sections under 601, like 601.1, .1, or 0 .2 .1, whatever, would not have their own items. Are they being amended? They may be. I, I might have lost but, a lot. Of that. I would say whatever you're doing in the ISOR to make it clear that the rationale is specific to a certain section, you want to set up the ET items the same way. Right. I think you'll have to see it and yeah. we'll have to work, um, you know, probably like you said, because, you know, the state fire marshal packages are sometimes there's more to it than just, you know, the straight general way to do it. So. I uh, and I see Arena has her hand raised, but I just want to add that, you know, just because the due date for the rulemaking package is December 1 doesn't mean we can't have, you know, a test run of, of your package and take a look at it and provide comments and advice on that too ahead of time. We're happy to exactly. do that. So we're not doing that in December and having things reformatted and cleaned up over the holidays. So we actually we gave that work group September 1 as their deadline. Okay. So you'll be seeing it soon. Soon. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, Arena, sorry, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Yeah. So, yeah, Crystal, basically, I wanted to repeat what Mia said. If you have questions about that, send that to me. Let's, and let's discuss and come up with a format that works the best for you and for us. 
and uh, as uh, as for eyesore explanations for every section being different, basically that's almost always the case. If there are several sections in the chapter being modified, the reasoning for each section usually different. And uh, what we do in eyesore under item one, we just have section number, let's say section one, <laughs> Let's say, and then reasoning for section one, and then after that, section two, and reasoning for section two. So then again, it does not necessarily need to be separate items, but they can be. That's not like black and white here, it's discussable. Absolutely understand. Okay, yeah, we'll have to just work together, and you'll see it soon. You're part of the work group, so very cool. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Crystal. Now with her hands. Mia, you still have your hand up, but I think you're done. Okay, there we go. Next slide. So here, um, I believe Emily asked a question um, earlier about the charging language. And what we like to see is we like to see the item first and then the charging language can go underneath that. Um, if that's what uh, you'd like, let's see, I don't think I have another example of that. So here's where I wanted to talk about that. So, um, does, does that help? Or what was your question exactly, Emily Withers? Oh, my question was since the template focused on um, making these these ETs more concise, that if that charging language was part of the template, because it didn't really have a little section where it had the gray insert charging text or something like that. Right. So for for like in for instance, if you have a uh, I know, I know HCD does, does their items by chapter. And so you would have item six and then you could put your charging language under that, if you will, and then go down to, and then add the rest of the chapter, the sections and, and that. So just use the same field, Emily, that has the insert express terms language. You can put your charging language in there. It, it just all needs to be formatted as normal and not as a heading. Yeah. Just like this shows here on this slide. So what I wrote was, here's an example of express terms items. Some agencies include all sections within a chapter under one item, but I'm not saying that's how yours has to be done, but it is a way. Uh, notice that item is the first header here that goes into the chapter and title below that it explains what is within the chapter. Item numbers do not have to coincide with the chapter numbers or, and again, you are not required to have all the chapter under one item. Another option, if you're dealing with one chapter, you can break it up within the section. So uh, like DSA has 11B, and I know that's all one chapter. So you could you can have a number of sections within one item, and then you could have another item, and, and you know it's like eleven B one hundred one can all be item one, and eleven B two hundred one can go down to item two if that's what you want. Um, there's many ways. Again, there's many ways to do this, and and again, you can check in with. Uh, us, the tech staff here, and we can work together on what that could look like. Tom has his hand raised. Hi, Tom. Hey, Beth, how you doing? So, I'm good. Just to be clear, um, so the bringing forward of existing California amendments, that language would only be used for triennial, right? For the intervening, we'd only be showing the new amendments that we are making. Yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Next slide. 
So before you start to copy and paste, you can set up your Word document for paste options in the upper left corner of your, uh, on your screen, <clears throat> you click on the arrow below the paste button, click on set as default. Um, I think I must have missed a step here. Scroll down and set your paste options that are shown right here. This helps to keep your document in the same format from what it was created. Next slide, please. For those additional 15 and 45 day comment periods where there will be double underline and double strike through on the express terms, please note that although the screen readers recognize double strike through, they do not recognize double underline. Therefore, you will need to type inside the brackets, begin double underline, and at the end of the double underlined words or sentence in double underline as shown here but for your document, please use black font to match the document. Next slide, please. Here's an example of what the text should look like in an express term with double underline when we run additional public comment periods. Please note, the highlight here is just for show, a definitely no-no for accessibility. Next slide. Now we're going to go into our ISOR document. Uh, again, this is all heading level one. Shown here, it remains a heading level one. Insert your agency's information to the correct highlighted in gray sections. Again, please do not copy and paste complete heading from a different source document. Next slide, please. Here again, what we recommend is keeping item, chapter, and section as heading level three, then down to CAC recommendation and agency response as heading level four. These items, item numbers here in the ISOR document should coincide with the express terms item numbers. Your descriptions, recommendations, and responses should all be in a normal style. I've added text as an example. Also, please add a separate CAC recommendation after each section number that has a proposed for change, whether it's new or an amendment. Um, it's helpful to have a CAC recommendation under each of them. Next slide, please. We have a hand raised. Hello. Go ahead, Derek. Thanks, Beth. Um, if you could go back to the previous slide, please. Just wanted to double check on this, that the, um, the text that is entered under the CAC recommendation and agency response headings, uh -huh. that text should be normal style as well? Yes, or is it something absolutely. Else? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, any of the, any of the text um, describe the purpose and rationale should be a normal style as well as enter any of the CAC recommendations and your response to those CAC recommendations should also be normal style. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah, so here's an example of the language we added to the ISOR document after the CAC meeting where the CAC has provided their recommendation regarding the newly proposed or changed express terms language. Text is added prior to the 45 day comment, 45 day public comment period submittal documents. This helps to assist commissioners when they are reviewing and making determinations of the regulatory documents proposed for changes. Next slide, please. Here is another example of how we like the headings and the text to remain as we formatted them. We just asked if you do make any changes, you keep the headings in a logical order. So if you, if you, you know, change your headings and, and you feel like, you know, your way is, you don't want to do it your way or whatever, just make sure that your headings are in a logical, a logical order. Always text should remain um, anytime you add any of the text identification of studies, you know, when you add that, that's a normal style 
as well. And if using list or bulleted items, be sure they are formatted properly to remain accessible when they are transferred over to a PDF. Next slide, please. For, you, for this document, um, we recommend that you don't paste or copy the entire list. If you copy and paste information from another source document, select the highlighted insert statement and paste your statements there. Please keep the format of this list intact. When inserting your data, you have multiple paragraphs. You could do soft returns. And anybody, uh, does everybody know how to do a soft return? Raise your hand if you do not know how to do a soft return. Mia. <laughs> okay, there's a couple. Okay, we need to explain how to do a soft return. Okay, I'm soft return. I'm sorry, go ahead. I said I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Well, I think, yeah, once, once you said it, everybody's like, oh, okay, we'll say it too. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that. Okay, a soft return is uh, say that you've entered information and, and you've, you've typed up a paragraph and you want to keep it in the list format, you hold the shift key and then enter. And that makes it a soft return and that doesn't take it out of the list format. It keeps it in a list format because once you have just a regular enter for the second paragraph to add, um, without adding it as a soft return, it takes it out of the list format is what we've noticed. So does that, did I, <laughs> did I explain that well enough? Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm putting a post-it on my monitor right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, Next so just slide. to reiterate, it's shift return, right? Yeah, shift and then hit enter. Yeah, shift return. Mm -hmm. And And I guess just, just to assure myself of this. Um, so the soft return is shift enter, but a, a uh, but hitting enter by itself, we refer to that as a hard return? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank hard, you for the hard clarification. Returns, hard returns break lists. If, if it's within a list item. So if your insert statement is more than one paragraph and you wanna keep it in list item A, then it needs to have a soft return. Those paragraphs need to have soft returns between them. Then when you go to item B and you only have one paragraph, then you would not use a soft return. Um, just, just, I guess one more question on this. Is it appropriate within an eyesore item to use soft returns or hard returns between each apparent paragraph um, within the rationale. In, in headings? No, within, within the, the body of the rationale. You can use hard returns as long as it's not within a list. Yeah, anytime you're working in a list format and you use hard returns, it, it when you switch it over to a PDF document, it then breaks the list in the in the PDF document is easier to in PDF documents, it's much easier to find out where lists are broken and things like that because it, it, it all the little tags does a great job of selling us out. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Irina? Yeah, so I wanted to add a little bit to that. So basically, unless you work in the list, inside the list, or inside the heading, then you can freely reuse hard returns. But if you work within the list or within the heading, if you use hard return, then you will broke either one of those. Like if you use it with, within the heading, you push hard return and then instead of one complete heading one, you will have two heading one. Mm. Same with lists. So 
if you use normal text, hard return, soft return up to you within lists and heading soft return. Thanks, oh. Irina. And Mia? Thanks. Um, you may have mentioned this and I might have missed it. I apologize. Did you explain what a list is? I mean, I, I think in my head I know what a list is, but that might help what, for folks understanding what a true list is. Do I? Have, I might be talking about this. Can I can I just say what I yes. think it is? And maybe that'll help. So for example, if you're drafting an express terms and you have a section number and it's section, you know, 5.102, and then it says uh, bird friendly shall comply with the following, and then below it is a one, two, three, four. That's a list, right? Yes. Okay. So that's yes. where you can use the soft return is to get to that one, two, three, four. All right, very good. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Next slide, please. Sorry, my mouse there. Okay, here are some common accessibility issues. Um, this is what we encounter usually, uh, all of us, me included. So we're documents, uh, we're document headings. We're not in a logical order. When starting your documents, make sure your document is structured with the appropriate heading rank and your hierarchy. Headings proceed in order. If you, you cannot start off with H2, and then go into H1 and then go into H3. So uh, we like them in a logical order. If headings are stru structured properly, uh, if headings are structured properly in one, they will also be structured properly in the PDF document. So if headings are structured properly in the Word document, they will be structured properly in the PDF document, provided you don't have any hard returns in the headings. <laughs> um, PDF document headings were not properly nested or tagged. Lists in words in Word was not a list. Within PDFs, the list didn't have the nested L tags or were broken up with P tags. Links, we had several documents with links in them that were non-compliant. For instance, my, uh, apparently my one of my slides that I have to fix. Um, Titles, always check to ensure you have entered the title of your document in the appropriate location. Uh, is there a show of hands of anybody that does, does not know how to add a title in their document, PDF or Word? <clears throat> and I miss this one too all the time. There's one. So, okay, so when you add a title in Word, you again can go into information <clears throat> and then click on information and it'll take you over to, um, I'm trying to do this. Yeah, the properties. And then you'll see where it says title and you could just add your title. The most common, uh, if, it's, if it's a submittal document for um, like an express terms, you're submitting to us your express terms. What we like in the title is generally how it goes is like BSC. And then we have the rulemaking number, which was explained to you earlier. Um, I think then goes the uh, type of document that you're working on ET. And then you would, um, and dashes all in between these. And then you would add your part, part one, part two, whichever uh, uh, title 24, document you're working with. And then a lot of times you can add initial or 45 day, whichever you're working on. So that's that's kind of what we like in our titles for our um, submittal documents, our rulemaking documents. <clears throat> Derek has his hand up. Hi, Derek. Hi again. Um, one of the other uh, 
formatting and, and drafting elements that is sometimes difficult for people to understand through screen readers is the use of acronyms uh, or abbreviations. Yes. Can you give us any guidelines on using acronyms and abbreviations? Um, of course, within the rulemaking process, we refer to BSC, we refer to the CBC, we refer to DSA in our office. And um, should, should we be eliminating those kind of acronyms and abbreviations and instead spelling the words out completely? Um, well, it reads, yeah, we can, or I know I still use, um, you know, like, at, well, let me think about this. Let me think this through. I know when I first refer, say, like, Building Standards Commission, and then I, you know, put the parentheses and then BSC, and then everything else after that, I'm, I'm okay adding BSC. Now for um, uncommon things, I would, I would spell them out. Um, the same rules apply for a written document is you spell it out the first time, state the acronym in parentheses, and then you can use the acronym. But you I know, know when we go to uh, uh oh, you cut out. Yeah. Oh no, I I, I stopped saying anything because I didn't want to uh, step on your your audio. I, I would point out that with screen reader, it sounds like this. Uh, okay, it's not meaningful. Yeah. Correct. Derek, yes. This is Carol. Um, the the differential difference there is the vowel. Any abbreviation that has a vowel in it, the screen reader is going to attempt to make into a word. If there's not a vowel, it will get the acronym correct. So BSA is going to have that issue where BSC doesn't. If it's in a in the a part of the text where it's visible and people are reading it. I think you you just have that, and probably people with screen readers have gotten kind of used to it, um, and will translate that in their head. If you're in a place where it's not showing, like in an alt text, or even in the title, places like that, you can put a period in between each each letter, and it will it it will interpret it more more accurately. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Welcome. Carol. Crystal has her hand raised. Hi, Crystal. Yeah, I remember last time with lists and say, you know, it's one, two, three, four, and we are proposing to delete two and then, you know, renumber the rest of the list. I remember that was very challenging and I don't even remember how to correct that. Is, is that something that your staff can help with or <clears throat> is that Lists are difficult for for many reasons I know for especially for us when we're doing our rulemaking documents and we are some part of a list is underlined another you know and in number two it's underlined number three it's uh being repealed or, or strict struck through um that makes it difficult that that pretty much makes it hard to keep it in a list format. So those are the exceptions to the rule. And thank you for bringing that up because um, I didn't add that exception to the rule. But yeah, oftentimes it is what it is. And, and we there's no fix around with it right now that I'm aware of. Irina has her hand up. Hi, Irina. Yeah, so uh, basically, Crystal, if you have a list, kind of list, but that list has uh, different types of fonts. Let's say it has underline, cross out, normal text, all kinds of things that we have to do in ET. You don't need to format that text as a list. Just go with normal format text without using list. Perfect. Because what we found out, if you use list, formatting and then there are different types of fonts used 
then when you listen to that in in VDA, it it reads all wrong for some reason. So <laughs> the most important thing is that it reads correctly. If it's a list or not list format, that's a secondary thing kind of thing. So yeah, if that's a complicated list, format it as a normal text. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks, Irina. Thanks, Crystal. All Any right. other hands? No more hands. Okay. So um, kind of like Derek was mentioning too, is uh, symbols. A lot of times in our express terms, we have authority cited. And then we add uh, health and safety code. And a lot of oftentimes people still use that uh, symbol that's shown there on the on the, on the screen. Um, they don't read those. So we need to spell those out. So spell out section anytime or any of the other symbols that you use. Um, underline, unless you're in an express term document, um, underlines, we don't, those are not um, accessible. And so don't use underline for emphasis. Uh, they should only be used for links and changes in your express terms. And so in the next slides, um, I will go over how to check tags, lists, links, and titles. And I forgot to mention um, in a PDF, when you're in a PDF document, right click, go into properties, and then you can add um, add your heading there. I forgot to mention, I told you where to find it in, in Word, but um, to find it in PDF, you need to right click, go to properties, and then you'll see where to add the heading. Ryan has his hand up. Hey, Ryan. Hello, I have a question regarding symbols. Uh, uh -huh. As you can imagine within the code, especially with the engineering aspects, there are uh, formulas and equations that often use Greek symbols and subscripts and so on. Uh, again, these are in the model code or references. So what are we to do in those situations? Um, maybe because those don't read very well. Um, I'm, I'm trying to reflect on something that I heard. Um, maybe if we could use alt text on those um, instead of trying to type them out. And Carol, maybe you... Uh, and share on that as well? There are resources online where you can look up to see whether the symbol you're unsure about gets read correctly or not. So that would be your first re resource is to just look it up and find out whether screen readers handle it. Um, in the event that you need symbols that don't get interpreted correctly by the screen readers, then she's right that the alt text is gonna be your friend. All right, so it seems that uh, at times the requirements here are, and then the workarounds are really being limited by the technology of the screen readers. Yeah. Um, so hopefully the yes. screen reader software, people are aware of these issues to uh, help improve their products accordingly. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. So be extra careful during the accessibility process for your documents. Because when CBS posts your documents on our website, we have to ensure that the accessibility, there's no errors. If we make changes to the accessibility within your documents, um, we'll be sure to update you or just know off of the SharePoint to take that document for your next submittal. Next slide. Oh, no, we're on the next slide. Okay, stay right there. Uh, tags in PDF document. Tags are only found in PDF documents. Basic tags are P for paragraph, H for heading, L for list. You want to go through your document and review tags to ensure that they match the content. Screen readers have keyboard cut, uh, shortcuts that allow the user to navigate using H or L on their keyboard, among other shortcuts. You know, tags can be changed and moved around if necessary. They can also be hidden so that they are not read by the screen reader. 
And this is useful for the graphics that are added for a sighted reader, but are meaningless to a non-sighted reader. In the Department of Rehabilitation Training, they teach you uh, this in their PDF document training. This might be a good time to provide the correct link for DOR. Uh, so since we don't have a chat, I'm going to read it. It's dor.ca.gov slash home slash disability access services. And on that page, there are uh, links to the trainings that DOR provides. Yeah, they're really helpful. If you haven't gone through any of their trainings, they can be really, really helpful with your documents when you go to work on your documents again. Oh, Katrina has her hand up. Hi, Katrina. Hello. Hey, just FYI, the, um, <coughs> Carol has checked out and the DOR website is completely down. Even the links on our own homepage pointing to the accessibility resources are down. So that is probably what the issue was, not the incorrect. Um, Oh, good. Thank you. So it's it's just the website itself is having troubles. You were cutting in and out. We didn't get catch everything you said. Oh, sorry. Yes, the website, the DOR website is down. Okay. Okay. I'm able to access it on my phone. So it's not it's not the whole DOR website. It's the accessibility portion of the DOR website. If you go to the DOR homepage and click for that major branch of their website, it's it's just down at the moment. Okay. Okay, next. So that means it's not accessible then? <laughs> <laughs> Rim shot. Oh, I love it. <laughs> well played, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide, please. And and I, I feel like we've really gone through lists and I'm I'm not sure we need to go through any more of this because like you we pretty much covered lists. Next slide. Next slide. Issues with links. Links need to have meaningful text. The screen reader use the screen reader user navigates websites using a variety of techniques. One of those is to pull up a list of links, a feature, most, a feature of most screen readers, and navigate through that list. Given this, link text should be able to stand alone independently of its content, context. For example, links like click here and more are meaningless and out of context. HTTPS dot dot backslash backslash www is not necessary for opening a document in a browser. The computers automatically fill that in. It's most important for link text to make sense without the surrounding sentences or content. The link text alone should convey the function and purpose of the link. Link text should also be unique and easy to speak out loud. In the PDF document, the link function is accessible when you hover over it. You should see like a little hand that will have a little box with a W on it. So it's don't have links that our website or click here. Um, what's good to have and what mostly what I've found is like when I copy and click link uh, for building standards commission, say for the codes, um, it'll have all that HTTPS flex backslash backslash. But when you copy it and paste it, all it says is, is you know, California building standards codes or, or something of that nature. So it puts the correct meaningful text in for you, if you will. Any hands? No, ma'am. Number next. Number next. So 
So like here, meaningful text spelled out. You can do this in an existing document by unlinking the URL, then put a hyperlink on the meaningful part of the text. Be sure the old hyperlink is unlinked and the HTTPS is removed so there aren't two links. Make sure it is blue and underlined and goes to the correct website before you send it out anywhere. We always want to make sure we have. If yours is right, it's just down. Yeah. yeah. Next slide. Issues with titles in Word. I think um, I kind of covered that. This is one thing you know that even I miss a lot. It was the title of the document. Documents with no titles will show up as errors when you run the accessibility accessibility check, especially in the PDF document. This was a very common error in a lot of the documents submitted, and it's a very simple task to fix. Like again, like I said, go to File Info. Click on the properties button. This will open up a little box as shown here to add your information. And like I kind of uh, mentioned before, the title should consist of agency name, rulemaking number, document name, and title 24 code book that you're working on. So that could be like part 11, part 12, part six, and so on. Next. Titles in PDF. If you didn't add a title in Word, it definitely did not show up in the PDF document. And like I said before, right click on your, when you're in the document itself, right click and click on document properties and add the title of the document. When you run the accessibility check, it will always show title failed. Right click on title failed, select fix, and then the fix will show it as passed. Next slide. Issues with tables. So if tables are not formatted correctly, the screen reader will not read in a format that is understandable to a visually impaired person. The header rows do not read each time the screen reader moves to the new row, no header row or too many header rows. Kind of confusing, right? The table should read the whole header row across. And then when it jumps down to the next row, it should read the header then the row, and then the next column, it should go up and read the header, and then what's in that, you know, the next row, and so on throughout the document. To set your table up to read correctly, insert table with however many rows and columns desired. At some point while working in the table, you'll want to double click on the little box that's shown up there um, with the circle, and double click on that, and that'll bring up the left and right side. Well, it'll bring up the one on the left. And what you want to do is unclick banded rows and unclick first column and just leave header row clicked. So what that that'll help read when the screen reader reads it, it will read it correctly. So it'll read the first row, all the headers down to the second row, and then it'll read the header, then the second row, and then the header, then the second column row and so on. Um, anybody have any questions? Oh, let's read this one real quick. And if you didn't add, oh, oops, wrong one. <laughs> Another important part of the table when you're working on the tables in Word, when you're in the table, right click and open table properties and click on the row tab that's across the top. As shown here, deselect, allow row to break across the page, and select, repeat as header row across the top of each page. This helps to ensure the screen reader to read the table correctly, and it ensures that when you have a, a table that goes over two or three pages, it will again put the header row at the top of each new page. Anybody have any questions? Did I cover everything sufficiently or can I cover anything else that maybe I didn't cover that you have questions about? Go ahead, Emily. Uh, this is Emily Withers with HCD. Uh, I don't know if this question is really for Beth or for Irina, but um, there was mention of these related sections. For example, if our ET is not in continuous order on a certain 
you know, subject matter, whether it's gray water or not, like maybe the like changes in chapter two, and then there's other changes in chapter 15. And we wanted to identify the, the uh, related sections, what, what font, et cetera, um, location on the ET, and maybe even on the ISOR, do you want that information? Go ahead, Irina. Go ahead, Irina. So, Emily, uh, that is the best addressed by grouped items. That's the best way. And uh, probably the second best way, if you have like kind of charging text there, like it relates to item 15 further down the document or something like that. I would say. So the document still needs to be in order, like chapter one, chapter two, chapter whatever, and chapter 15. But you can mention that this particular item relates to whatever item further down the document and grouped items document. So Emily, we've provided a sample grouped items document in the external SharePoint folder that shows how a uh, one way to do that and and it would be a separate document. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, one more poll. One more poll. Let's see if Zoom works for me. This is Crystal. I, I have one more question. Hey Crystal. So um, I know in the last go around, the Word documents that were posted on the website were not locked. Is that something that's being discussed at BSC for future? Um, having those, um, the Word documents basically uneditable for general public? It is being discussed here. Um... And we are still, I think, in discussions about it. Um, I think Carol may know the answer to that. Mia? Sorry, the little icons at the bottom are a little slow here, sorry. So Crystal, let me ask a question about that because because we've gone back and forth over, over the years on only posting PDFs of the express terms so that, you know, technically they're not a Word document that can be altered. Um, but then with uh, the screen reader version issue, it seems to make more sense to just post the Word document. And so I'm trying to better understand the need to lock the document um, because if someone were, I mean, oftentimes we have people say, hey, I want to clip copy information out of the ET so that I can propose a, a comment and it would be easy for them to copy that language. But I want to try to understand better from you on the on the need for the document to be locked. Um, you know, I, I've got to think about how to answer that question. Um, I know that you know, Board of Forestry, we work with them a lot. They lock all their, their regulation packages. Mm -hmm. So it's only read only. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I understand, you know, the, the flexibility of, you know, using the language, especially with local jurisdictions, you know, because you can also do the cut and paste from a PDF. Mm -hmm. Easy. So, and those have never been locked either or protected, I guess is the technical term. Mm -hmm. um, let me get back to you. I, I don't know. I was just wondering if that was something that was being discussed. I know that others, other agencies and their rulemakings are typically protected. So general public cannot just cut and paste from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I would have to learn more about benefits and pros and cons of that or need for it. But yeah, I hear you.
Tom? Yeah, um, I think we normally have our documents locked and my concern, I don't have a problem with the cut and paste. My concern would be something that looks like an official HCD document that has been altered. Well, I mean, he, 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 here's, I guess, and maybe I'm, I'm naive in, in this a little bit, but I, I look at it like this, as anyone can, can take a CBSC document off the web page, they could modify it and they could send it around. And it's gonna look like an, a, a CBSC document being routed. But the reality is that the document posted on the website is sort of the record, right? So that I guess I'm looking at it as, if someone were to come to us and say, well, I have a different version and I'm gonna say, well, I, I don't know how to help you because the version that's on the website is, is the version that we posted to uh, for the public. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I think I have, I think there's a higher policy maybe than my pay grade on, on that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I guess I just tend to be a little paranoid or cynical, but yeah, I mean, yeah. if they want to, if they want to modify the document, they're going to find a way to modify the document. And yeah. like you said, you can always say, well, the one on the website is the official document. So you need to make sure that your document is matching that. Right, right. Okay. And, yeah. and, and let me let me be clear is they can't modify that the document on our website. Right, right. So yeah. Okay. So looking at the poll results, Beth, would you like to address? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the important the important part here is which is not an accessible format for an ET document. I mean, what is what is which is not an accessible because on it on ET documents, express term documents, underline and strike through is is totally appropriate. Any other documents, underline and strike through, I don't believe are appropriate. So shading and highlighting here is the correct answer only because express terms was mentioned in the question. So does that help explain? Any other questions, comments, accessibility? And if anybody ever has uh, any questions or comments or concerns, please, you can always email us here um, at BSC at any time. Is that me that needs to close that? Got it. There. So is this me or you now? Oh, oh there's a lot of hand up. Go yeah. Ahead. It's just for the new folks. Um, when I was new, it was a little confusing as to why the initial express terms was also called initial express terms when it was put out for 45 day. And so I, I think it would be helpful for the new folks to explain why that is. Irina, do you want to address that? Yeah, I can. Um, so we have two express terms, initial express terms and uh, final express terms. So uh, what goes in the middle between those um, goes public be, uh, before a 45 day public comment period. And uh, we have a template for that called 40, um, 45-day express terms. But in reality, that is still initial express terms because that's supposed to be, um, how do you say that? Same document with some modifications based on CAC recommendations. So, and after a public comment period, we work on the final express terms and that also have a separate template. So there is a little bit of a disconnect here, maybe 
because we have three templates, initial express terms, 45 express terms, and the final, but the term is, there are just two terms, initial express terms and the final express terms. Hopefully I get it uh, and I'm explained. So ask if that's not clear. Thank you, Irina. George? Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, just a, a clarification regarding the form 399. Um, yeah, the 399 is required um, for all submittal package elements, even those that don't change, that don't have a change of regulatory effect, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, correct. In the, in the cases of no change of regulatory effect where the proposal is to merely add a definition, the 399 would still be required, but you would just check the box that there would be no impact to anything, correct? Correct. Thank you. Yeah, box H, I think it is that you would check yeah. and then go to page four and fill out the rest from there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Anybody else? Well, thank you all so much for uh, being here with us today and taking the time to learn about our rulemaking. So again, if you have any, any questions, concerns, or comments, you can always call or uh, email us here at the Building Standards Commission. This session was recorded and will be available upon request. And then we have another one, picture of all of us. Our last slide. Our last slide. And here we are. Yay. Oh, Mia has her hand up. <laughs> Hi, Mia. Hey, I want to thank everybody and, and the staff for putting this together because I know it's a big lift. Um, but I also want to mention that, you know, there's some things we don't go into great detail um, during the training. And um, the Office of Administrative Law conducts rulemaking training now it's it's specific to rulemakings that go through their office but they go into really great depth about authority and reference and some of the other important elements of a rulemaking so that's good training to attend as well um and i don't know if we want to i i don't know how often they offer that training but i know our our uh, our new staff usually attends that it's, it's a, it used to be a two-day training right it's pretty lengthy it's it's a pretty long training. So um, it, it provides a lot of good information, but keep in mind that for context, there's the nuances to the Building Standards Commission process as well. Thank you. All right, well, I think that's it, everybody. All right, you guys all have a great day today and look forward to your rulemaking packages. Thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal, for your participation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I need a new picture. That's a wonderful picture. Oh, God.